All right. Hi there, everyone. We're just going to take a moment as attendees log in. Thank you so much for joining tonight. This is the uh, Berkeley Public Library running Popping the Science Bubble, um, a fantastic partnership with uh, UC Berkeley. Cal features um, our great features graduate students sharing their projects. Um, and yeah, thanks for logging in tonight. We'll just take a moment there. Um, we have two bird themed presentations that we are so excited to promote. Um, and we actually have a bunch of other bird themed presentations coming up at the library and I'll talk more about those once we get started. All right. uh, I'm gonna go ahead and see if our Facebook live stream is working. Not yet. Okay, yeah, and we're just taking a moment as folks are logging in. Yeah, it does not look like we're live on Facebook yet. Okay. Um, all right. Okay. So have more people coming. Thank you so much. In. All right. All right, excellent. And as folks are logging in, I just want to remind people too that if you're into birds, you might be into our Cal Falcon events that we're having this week, this Thursday, if you tune in at 6:30. Um, Sean and Lynn Peterson, the representatives of the Cal Falcons, are going to describe the exciting year at the Campanile um, all in one session. Um, and we're going to learn more about uh, UC Berkeley's favorite Falcon family um, at uh, 6.30 on Thursday. Next week, we have um, two um crow scientists who are going to discuss avian intelligence that's on tuesday may 24th at 11 a.m to 12 p.m in the morning um and uh diana lau and melissa johnston are going to call in from tubing in germany and talk about um avian intelligence and that event is actually online but it's also going to be broadcasted in person at the library okay so it looks like um attendance is kind of stabilized just a bit. So I'm gonna go ahead and introduce Popping the Science Bubble and tonight's program here. Um, so hello everyone. Thank you so much uh, for tuning in tonight and welcome to Popping the Science Bubble. Um, this is a uh, monthly seminar series that aims to share new research findings from grad students and postdocs at UC Berkeley with the general public and create constructive discussion about a variety of science topics. We have two speakers at each seminar who will talk about their current research or a topic that they find really interesting. Um, the organizers are three graduate students at UC Berkeley, Jenna, Madison, and Oksana. The program happens every third Tuesday of the month at 5.30 p.m. Right now it's happening virtually on Zoom. At some point we hope to bring it in person to the library, but the library doesn't quite have evening hours yet. So we'll let you know when that happens. Um, if you're interested in re-watching this seminar or checking out other past seminars, you can visit uh, Popping the Science Bubbles website and you can also visit their YouTube account. 
um, where you can watch the other seminars. Um, we, I also really encourage you to sign up for their listserv so you can stay in the loop um, for upcoming seminars and um, just learn about the Popping Science Bubble community. Um, all right, I'm going to leave it up to the uh, Popping the Science Bubble team to introduce tonight's speakers. Thank you so much. Thanks, Kelsey, for the introduction. And before we start with our speakers, um, we want to remind everyone that um, with the format of the seminar, we encourage questions um, that you can type out in the chat if you're on Zoom or um, on the Facebook live video um, commenting area as well. And we'll ask your questions in real time on behalf for you toward the speakers. And of course, you can always ask questions too toward the end of the talk. Um, and like Kelsey said, sign up for our listserv to stay updated about our upcoming seminars. And I'd like to highlight one more time that this beautiful painting you see over here is an original piece of art by one of our speakers, Dr. Silu Wang. So I'll stop sharing now. And with that, let Oksana introduce Silu. Our first speaker today is Dr. Silu Wang, who is a passionate explorer of nature's truth and beauty. She grew up in China and immigrated to Canada when she was in college and studied integrative biology in British Columbia, Texas, and California. She is a Canadian with a globalist heart wishing for a harmonious world with all living beings. She is excited about the origin and evolution of biodiversity and is seeking ways to understand and conserve them in the sixth extinction. During the weekends, she loves painting, dancing, and being in the wilderness. We are very excited for your talk. Take it away, Sue. Awesome. Thank you, um, ladies, uh, for this wonderful event. Um, <clears throat> so I will be talking about speciation in birds. So before I start, um, I have a question for the audience. Um, so how many species of animals um, do we have on Earth, roughly speaking? Uh, <laughs> Um, some guesstimate numbers, thousands or um, millions, how many <laughs> uh, animal species? You can type in the chat, um, no cheating, please don't Google. Um, uh, I can't quite see the chat. Oh, oh yeah. um, here. So we so we have some numbers, um, 1.3 million, 500 oh, million, great 10 guesses. million or billions. <laughs> <laughs> okay, great, great guesses. So we have roughly 2 million animal species on Earth and um, a lot more species in total on Earth. And um, these are important creatures for our society. Um, they disperse the seeds, fertilize our land, pollinate our crops, and really help us to govern this harmonious biosphere that our society relies on. Um, so uh, what are species really? Um, species, um, some, some guesses <laughs> again. Um, so what do you think are species? Um, um, or maybe um, uh, raise your hand if you are, um, oh, so uh, Natalie had a um, pretty good um, answer, uh, animals that can breed with each other. Um, and Julie uh, said specific groups of animals that can interbreed with each other and unique organism, James, uh, unique organism that can reproduce with each other. Okay, um, I, I like the answers because every, um, all the answers are themed about reproduction. Um, it's um, about the gene flow, about um, reproducing um, ongoing gene flow among um, um, groups of in, um, individuals. And if we can still um, uh, exchanging gene pools, then uh, we're still the same species. Um, so they are a species are natural units of um, biodiversity. 
And the concepts of species are actually highly debatable still in the field of speciation research. And, um, but there are largely groups of interbreeding organisms that are or in the process of becoming independent evolutionary trajectories. And when we think of evolutionary trajectories, it's uh, fascinating that these um, distinct animal species were one um, around 1.3 billion years ago. And, uh, and over time, um, gene flows um, could um, uh, uh, deteriorate and these become individual species. Um, so, um, so I have another question um, that what are, uh, so what, what is the common feature about these animal species that I showed you earlier? Like a common feature in terms of their conservation status. Hint. Any guesses? Endangered? Um, um, close. These are actually extinct um, creatures in uh, 2019. So, um, so it's important, um, it's especially important time to understand um, the speciation research in terms of the species, the units of biodiversity, um, because we're quickly losing um, natural biodiversity before we understanding, uh, we really understand them. And um, over 35,000 species are threatened with extinction um, that there are um, uh, about to join these, these guys. Um, so, um, so, uh, so it's a really um, uh, an important time. Um, so what, uh, why should we understand such process driven view of um, biodiversity is because that's the nature of biodiversity. Over time, um, every generation, um, mm -hmm. these gene pools change and they change um, how they inter um, how they exchange um, genetic materials with each other and also change in terms of the compositions within the group. And uh, to really understand how to conserve them, we have to understand this dynamical nature of animal species, uh, of species, not just animal species, plants and um, microbe species as well. Um, so speciation is the process um, of how these um, distinct uh, um, evolutionary trajectories establish over time. It's a process by which barriers to gene flow accumulate until um, this, um, the completion of reproductive isolation. Um, so how can this process really occur has been a fundamental puzzle in biology and an enduring question since the very beginning of evolutionary biology. Um, because we don't have a time machine, so we can't um, reconstruct, we can't really go back uh, millions of years ago to watch this um, process to occur over time. But we could replay the tape of life by comparatively studying species pairs in the different stages of speciation. Um, so my work um, at uh, UC Berkeley and uh, other institutions have been um, trying to understand this uh, progression of um, uh, comparatively understanding the progression of um, reproductive isolation, uh, starting from within species polymorphisms to early stage speciation in the wood warblers um, to um, um, Asian African fruit flies uh, in the intermediate spe uh, stage of speciation and uh, to the later stage of speciation, uh, live bear fishes and uh, tinamous, um, the, the um, uh, paleognithi birds that I'll tell you more about later. Um, so by comparatively studying species pairs in different stages of speciation, uh, we could reconstruct this um, understanding of um, um, such a fascinating evolutionary process. 
And I will mostly tell you the story of these, uh, uh, this sister pair in the very early stage of speciation. Um, that's the um, around the Pacific West, um, just right around this time of the years. Um, so I wonder how many birders are here. Uh, raise your hands if you're birders. Um, so some of you might see them migrating um, um, up north, uh, just around now. And there, there are um, these birds, uh, the hermit warblers, actually spend the summer and breed um, breeding season here in California. Um, but um, but you might have seen them these town sandy warblers. Uh, recently flying through Berkeley. I used to, um, they get very uh, approachable in the migration season um, around Berkeley. Um, that's such a luxurious situation because they are usually really far away from the ground um, uh, in the breeding season. So, um, um, and these warblers are important um, um, species pairs, not just for understanding um, these fundamental question in evolutionary biology, but also very practical type of um, studying organisms. They are the indicator species of the coniferous forest over the summertime. Um, and so they, um, they could help us to understand and predict um, the forest response to climate change. Um, they are also the nest pa natural pest controllers, um, pest controls that um, they are uh, insectivores. They forage mostly um, um, a, a lot of pest uh, insect species um, that really safeguard the forest from the drought pest um, climate change feedback loop. Um, so, and um, so, uh, so now with this uh, sister pairs, uh, what is the genetic, um, um, so my work has been really trying to address what is the genetic architecture of speciation um, in this sister species. Um, so, um, so to understand this question, we have to go to the hybrid zone uh, where these uh, in individuals are still interbreeding and exchanging gene pools um, and to, um, to find the genetic mechanism that prevents hybridization. Um, so conveniently, the Burke Museum in Seattle had collected um, hundreds of specimens from the hybrid zone in 1980s. Um, so this allow um, like a virtual time machine um, to um, um, to track these historical, to track the changes of these hybrid populations uh, from 1980s to current to present days. So I um, uh, um, uh, took these uh, field notes of these amazing naturalists in 1980s that um, they uh, recorded the exact coordinate where um, the, they sampled the birds. And um, so I could revisit these um, sites um, to the exact same location and um, sample individuals of hybrids in these um, in the contact zone between species. So we so, have a question for you, Silu. Oh, great. Um, the question is, can sister species birds tell that another bird is from a different species or is not an eligible mate? or do they sometimes meet accidentally? And I'm not sure if you're about to get into this question. Perfect question, because I'm about, that's exactly um, what, what, where I'm gonna um, <laughs> head to. So stay tuned. Um, that's the kind of um, the initial way that we could really start teasing apart uh, the barriers to gene flow um, that really shapes this origin of species. Um, because, um, uh, because one individual star, starts to assortatively mate, or they can tell apart different species, individuals. And um, this is the time when the gene flow starts to diminish. And that's the time when the speciation occurs. So, um, so that's the, the, the perfect question for, for this system. So to answer this question, we have to go to the hybrid zone uh, where they still exchanging gene pools. And um, um, so these are really beautiful uh, places in the Cascade Mountain Ranges um, over here in Washington. 
and towards the foothills of the glaciers. Um, so we got into the heart of these evergreen forests and we bushwhacked into um, these uh, woods and we heard the birds singing from the, uh, the top of the forest because um, they are the canopy nesters and um, really far away from the ground. Um, that's probably why they were called hermit warblers, uh, even though they are brightly colored. Um, they're just really hard to, um, to see even for very experienced birders. Um, so, um, so in these nomadic camping in the old growth uh, this, uh, expedition, we get to know, um, luckily we get to know many uh, local indigenous communities um, and they are so knowledgeable and uh, their life rely on the forest, uh, everyday lives. So, um, so let's help to protect these beautiful forests together. Um, and then so with, uh, um, we lure these, um, we lure them down with playbacks. So we recorded the sounds of the birds and we play them back to them and, and then um, uh, bait these sound tapes underneath the sound recordings, underneath the mist nets so that we can uh, lure these um, hermit wobblers down to the nets and um, catch them with mist nets. And um, so they're really hard to catch relative to other songbirds, just because they, they're really uh, um, um, kind of um, elusive in, in their behavior, in their um, canopy specialist type of behaviors. Um, so in the hyperzone, we caught all kinds of uh, individuals, those that look like one of the parental species or the other or a mix of the two. Um, so then we can see, uh, we can try to um, use these um, uh, genetic uh, information uh, to understand uh, what are the um, genetic underpinnings of these plumage traits and also whether these plumage traits are involved in species recognition, like telling each other apart between species. So, um, uh, so here's a map uh, showing you the historical sampling of this um, distribution of the plumage color um, ancestries over space from the hermit warbler type of ancestry and gradation into um, the Townsendi warbler type of ancestry. And you can see that um, my my um, current sampling uh, was fairly similar to the historical sampling in terms of where the species boundary is. And, and then uh, we also take a drop of blood from these uh, live birds. It's like a little blood test and then releasing them back to their breeding ground to uh, resume their reproductive mission. Um, so inside the genome, we are looking for uh, genetic underpinnings that regulates these species specific um, um, plumage colorations. And um, so, so basically in the genome, there are, um, you can imagine that the Townsendi ancestry being colored in um, um, the magenta and then the hermit warblers color in turquoise. These genomes, along the genome, these ancestries um, just permeate in the, these hybrid genomes um, at different locations. And there are so many different combinations in hybrids. So then we can associate um, the plumage variations in the hybrids, the, the color differences in the hybrids with their genotype ancestry information. So then we can find the exact um, genomic location that regulates the species color differences. And, um, and here is how that look like in the, in the data that along these different chromosomes, we're looking at um, a statistic that shows how um, um, likely this region explains the variation in colors among species and hybrids. And here is, um, we find a peak within chromosome 20 that nests within a gene called ACE, um, agouti signaling protein. So this gene has been shown to be um, related to um, plumage coloration in uh, all kinds of vertebrates, um, in birds and other vertebrates. 
including human as well. Um, and so, the, and we find a very unique kind of behavior of this gene block in, in terms of painting the colors on the hybrids. Because, um, so in most of the hybrids, um, this gene has been regulating both the face of the birds and also the, uh, the flank streakings of the birds. Um, so then um, the hybrids look, uh, in their face, they look like one parental species, the hermit wobblers, but on the side bodies, they look like the other parents. So they are a mismatch of the two ancestries. Um, and later, um, I find that these, um, uh, these plumage traits are actually important for social interactions between individuals. And, um, and uh, so, the, so then the individuals with mismatched plumage ancestry, these hybrids are beaten up by others in the hybrid zone. Um, so this uh, is like a behavior experiment in the wild that we introduce this artificial decoy um, um, with a polymer clay uh, painting and then, and then observe the behaviors of the hybrids. So, so we show that when the hybrids, uh, they tend to, if they ha have the mismatched plumage ancestries, um, they have the heterozygous, they tend to have the heterozygous uh, ancestries of the two parental forms, um, and they tend to do worse at territorial interactions. So, so this is an example of how a single gene, a GUTI signaling protein um, has been, Inter, um, preventing the gene flow at natural species boundaries. And um, so that's one example of um, um, barriers to gene flow and how is preventing uh, gene flow over time. Um, so, and um, I'm going to show you, um, so there are, I actually find other genes um, that also contribute to speciation in this sister pairs. So over time, you see that um, uh, um, uh, different genes prevent gene flow um, and they um, establish this uh, kind of very um, uh, wiggling species boundaries um, over time in the face of gene flow. Um, so this is like um, kind of the pillars in the Greek ancient Greek temples that over time, these um, gene flow would wash away um, the decorates, you know, the walls and, and so forth, but the pillars would still remain and, um, and really define the species boundaries. So, um, and with that, I want to quickly shift um, to this older stage of speciation um, uh, to mention you might work in the Tinamus um, in the South America. So these are elusive birds. Also, somehow I, I like uh, hermit um, birds. So, um, but they they lay the so they, they're really dull looking birds, um, and you usually don't see them. Also, avian birders in South America usually miss them because they are just so um, uh, cryptic in their plumage and also in their behavior. But uh, but they lay these beautiful eggs, um, a different color, very colorful eggs, and they're the only only ground nesting songbirds that don't have camouflaged nests. Um, so, so one, uh, so yeah, just how fascinating their eggs are. Different colors, different species have different egg colors, and, and they're glossy and um, like Easter eggs. Um, and um, here's an example of how um, in this clade of tinamous, how these egg colors are divergent among species are so different in different species. Um, so uh, so uh, Dr. Patricia Brennan, um, an ornithologist, field ornithologist, uh, raised this hypothesis that um, these eggs could be the, um, uh, yeah, she's a great uh, Latin American um, field biologist um, observing these cryptic birds in the wild and um, raised this uh, uh, hypothesis that these uh, egg colors could be used um, as species recognition signals. 
and um, and these can be the relics of speciation characters that we can still um, um, trace um, in the, in the current day. So um, so I uh, basically tested her prediction um, by reconstructing the range history of these um, tinamo species and uh, and find that the the species that co occurred in their uh, eco regions they tend to and also if they share the sun space also they tend to have different egg colors so this suggests that um, the eggs in the speciation history could also have um, serve as a barrier to gene flow between species and preventing um, these gene flow um, to generate the, the, the recent fauna. And, and uh, over my speciation research, I increasingly recognize that how hard it is to generate new species given um, these establishments of barriers. Um, and it is always washed away and or counteracted by gene flow um, over time. So, um, so, it's, um, so let's appreciate, and this really raised the appreciation of um, the beautiful uh, and diverse um, species that we already have and hope we still um, um, have them in the, uh, in the midst of six extinction. Okay, that's all for now. And I hope <laughs> there's still some time for questions. Hey, thank you so much, Silu, for an amazing and really fun talk. Um, yeah, and so if you have questions, um, feel free to put them in the Q&A box or chat box. And oh, we have one that came up pretty quickly. So one of them is, in addition to genetic barriers, um, does spe bird species competition inhibit mating interactions? Oh, good question. Um, yes, um, that's um, um, actually for this warbler clade, um, the, the study, um, so they are known for refined niche partitioning uh, in the same pine tree that different species partition um, different um, parts of the tree. So, so it's, it's likely driven by uh, um, competition as well. Um, so uh, they, these are the like very cool uh, extrinsic and intrinsic um, processes, eco-evil processes that shape species boundaries that could all be incorporated in the understanding of this process. Great, thank you. Um, and I don't, I'm not a biologist, so I don't know if this is a good question, but I was curious when you um, like process the genome and look at them, like, is it possible to like tie in like these genetic events of speciation with different times in history, or do you need other pieces of evidence in order to do that? Oh, great question. That's what I'm doing now to reconstruct the, um, so we call that coalescence history of, um, um, so tracing all the genotypes back to the common ancestors to date the divergence time um, of certain genes or certain pieces of genes. Um, yeah, so good question. So basically, um, so we find um, it, it's really uh, very, very new results, um, but we find that, um, so uh, there was some mitochondria gene divergence before the color gene divergence, and that's um, coinciding with um, a nuclear, another nuclear genomic region um, that co-function with mitochondria um, to diverge. So it seems like there might be some synergistic um, relationship among these speciation genes. Okay, cool. Thank you. I'm glad to know that now. And then um, we'll take one last live question, but if people have more questions for Silu, feel free to um, type them in the chat box and she'll um, respond back in text. Um, but our last live question for this talk is, if could you explain a little bit more on why egg color would inhibit gene flow? I'm guessing like I was a little bit curious about this too, because usually, you know, like um, eggs are the result of mating. So how would like potential mates know beforehand, I guess, whether 
they can great questions you guys yeah great questions so far um so that's uh, about the really special mating systems of the tinamus that i didn't have time to go through um, you're right that usually is a, the end product but but for tinamus um the dads are the ones that mates with multiple moms um so um so they collect a bunch of eggs from other females so then that means the upcoming females would um, have to, you know, use the cues of the existing nest. So the males usually dance in front of the nest um, to court the females and mate with her. And then she lay eggs and, you know, and move on to other, other nests. And then, um, and then usually, so she will see the eggs inside the nest. Um, already for the males, um, so so this way the upcoming females would know uh, would would recognize that signal of conspecifics, so that she wouldn't waste the effort to mate with the, the heterospecifics, and also the males could also identify the wrong wrong eggs colors and not incubate those um, to not waste the paternal um, efforts on these hybrid eggs. <laughs> Okay, wow, that's so cool. Yeah, thank you so much for sharing your answers to the, um, our questions. And yeah, again, if you have more, type them in the chat. But we'll give a virtual applause again to Silu for a fantastic talk. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. And, um, and now we'll move on to our second speaker, and I'll be introducing Devin. And if you want to um, get your slides ready while I give your introduction. So Devin grew up on Long Island in New York. She was introduced to bird research at UCLA where she completed a bachelor's in biology and master's in physiology. After a brief stint studying epidemiology at Columbia University, she has returned to California where she's a fourth year PhD student in the Department of Integrative Biology at UC Berkeley and studies bird behavior and physiology. Outside of research, Devin enjoys making ceramics, eating pizza, and being active in the outdoors, especially through hiking and playing lacrosse. Hey, so take it away, Devin. Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for coming and for having me here at Popping the Science Bubble. I'm really excited to be part of Bird Week. Um, and today I'll be talking about how birds cope with stress, and I'll mostly focus on behavior um, a lot of my research looks at the intersection of behavior and physiology, um, but we won't get too much into the physiology today. Um, so yeah, let's jump into it. Um, I wanna start with some situations. Um, so I'm going to take you through three situations and I'll just show you an image and I want you to think about um, how you would react if all of a sudden you were taken from wherever you are right now and just put in that situation. Um, what would you do? And it's, it'll be pretty simple. It's nothing too complex. And you're welcome to write in the chat or you can just think of it um, to yourself. Um, it, it should only take about five seconds or so to kind of think it through. Um, so here's the first one. Um, imagine if you were just kind of put in this uh, pretty but very cold looking uh, scene. What do you think you would do? Okay, so um, some things that you that I would do, I'd probably start shivering. I'm not kind of dressed for this setting, right? And then maybe I'd put on a jacket or I'd go inside. Um, so there's a few different options for you know, what you might do when it's cold. Um, yeah, so I see a lot of people saying, try to stay warm, um, burn energy for heat. Yeah, exactly. So let's go to the next situation. Okay, so it's about dinner time right now. Maybe you feel really hungry. Um, what do you think you would do to um, fix that? Yeah, exactly. I'm seeing people say eat, go to the fridge, make a sandwich. Um, definitely. So you're going to go out and you're going to look for food so that you're no longer hungry. Um, that makes sense. Okay. And now here's our last situation. Um, so, uh oh, we're sick. Uh, there's a foreign pathogen in us. What happens? What do you do when you're sick? How do you usually respond?
yeah, so I'm seeing someone put rest in the chat. Exactly. You sleep, you rest, um, maybe take some extra vitamins. So you, you're not very active. So it's very different maybe from what you would do when you're cold or when you're sick. Um, uh, you have to take a COVID test for sure these days. Um, all right. So you can think about how you respond to these different situations. Um, oh, this is what you might do when you're sick. Um, and I know we all think about stress on a daily basis. I'm sure everyone is familiar with stress. Maybe, you know, you're rushing to a meeting, you have an exam to take, something's happening um, in, the fa in your family. There's all different stresses that we experience every day. Um, and, but for the sake of this talk and for what we're um, gonna be discussing today, I wanna think about stress um, a little bit differently. So that's a very, simplest form, it's just going to be a disruption of homeostasis or a perturbation. So essentially, we're going to think about stress as just like a change to your normal self. So you have your set normal, kind of your content um, state. And so a stress is just going to be this state disrupted. Um, and that's caused by stressors, which are just environmental factors that can change that normal feeling that you usually have. And we often think of them as negative, but they can also be positive or neutral. So those three situations that we went through, so we can say like temperature, hunger, sickness, those can all be stressors that cause our body stress. It's something that a lot of times we might need to fix or bring back to our normal state. Um, so in the wild, you can imagine that animals are constantly dealing with changes in their environment. There's always going to be something happening. Um, and so today I'm going to talk to you about how birds, specifically zebra finches in my case, um, deal with some of the situations we went through and why that might be important um, to understand for both humans and birds. Um, so let me introduce you to zebra finches, the um, animal that I study. Um, this is a male zebra finch on the right. It has these little orange cheek patches and these black and white stripes giving its name zebra finch. Um, and on the left, we have this female. Um, and these birds are native to Australia. So they live, I think, mostly in central Australia where the environment can be quite unpredictable. Um, and so they're opportunistic breeders, which is just um, a way of saying they don't breed seasonally. They um, wait until the situation is right and they can breed all year round. So as long as they have all the resources ready, um, they can breed. So they're great to study um, how different changes um, could affect their behavior and physiology. Um, and we can study these birds at the field station not too far away, um, where we have this kind of indoor-outdoor setting um, and these giant um, free-flying aviaries where they can stay um, and they basically have all the resources they can need or want to be happy. Um, so this is kind of a normal day for a zebra finch. So if you think about your normal day, um, they have food, they have water, they have a bunch of friends, they have perches, um, they can do whatever they want. They can fly around, they can sleep, they can um, hang out in the nest box. Um, so this is just kind of their normal activity. Um, so we can say this is like their homeostatic state, so to speak. Um, as a group. Um, okay, so now I'm going to take you through the same situations that we went through together for ourselves. Um, we're going to look at how birds respond or these zebra finches respond behaviorally to the same situation. Um, so, oops, sorry, this video is a little bit crooked. I'm not the best um, film uh, person, but you can see that uh, this is a day where it's a little bit cold. So to them, cold is like 60 degrees. Um, and I heard uh, earlier in the chat, someone had said maybe they would eat more, try to generate energy. Um, and so the finches kind of do that here. So we shiver and they do something that's kind of equivalent to shivering. Um, they generate heat by making muscle contractions. And so as a result, they actually end up burning a lot of energy when it's cold out. So it's a little bit dark in this video, but down here, there's kind of a plate of food 
And you can see they're just constantly eating throughout the day whenever it's cold. So that's kind of a good kind of behavioral signal to us that indicates they're experience, experiencing some kind of change in their environment, maybe some kind of stress that they're trying to ameliorate. Okay, so let's take them. So cold, they're eating a lot. Um, how about when they're hungry? So now we kind of remove that food dish. And this is kind of only within seconds or minutes of taking that food dish out. You can see that they're all of a sudden really active. Um, they're hopping around, they're looking for the food. Um, they're just trying to find where that food is. Um, so they're very active when they're hungry, looking for food, kind of like what we would do. Um, okay. And so now, how about when they're sick? So I have a little video here for you. It's kind of, sorry, it's small, um, but you can kind of focus on this bright orange um, label right there. And that bird ha is experiencing an immune challenge. So it's been given something that makes it feel sick, even though it isn't necessarily sick. And you can see that it's also kind of responding how you might respond. So all the other birds around it, for the most part, are not sick. They're healthy. They can fly around. They move around. Um, but this bird, it's not moving, right? This video goes on for a while. We won't watch the whole thing um, because it just sits there and it sleeps the whole time. Um, and we can see in this picture here, this is something that birds do when they're either cold or sick. They tend to fluff up their feathers and they just kind of sit there and don't look very happy. Um, so again, these are just examples of how um, birds might respond to different stressors. Okay, so that's interesting how they respond to these individual changes in their environment, but um, realistically in the wild, it's more likely that there will be multiple stressors um, at any one time. So those videos I just showed you, it's a very controlled environment, right? We can um, manage what's happening at each time. But um, in theory, maybe they'll be, it'll be really cold and they will also feel, they won't feel good or it'll be, they'll be hungry and they also won't feel good. So we can look at how they respond to multiple stressors and get a little bit more insight into how they balance their different physiological and behavioral processes and how they prioritize which stress to deal with. Um, and so let's think about if it's cold out and these birds are hungry, so the food isn't readily available. Um, think about for a second what you think they will do. So we saw in the cold, they usually eat a lot, but now if there isn't food around, what do you think they're going to be doing? Okay, so um, you might not know, right, because it's conflicting. So I see someone saying maybe they get fluffy, they shiver, they look for food. Okay, so I think originally I might think they they would act kind of um, like the hungry birds where they would go around searching for food. Um, and um, what happens is, so someone actually put this in the chat. Um, so this is an interesting video. They end up realizing that um, there isn't food, even though they would like to use it to produce heat on their own. Um, and they, energy is a really um, important, of course, resource for them. So in order to conserve energy, but still produce heat or maintain heat, they all are kind of piling into this one nest box on the wall. I don't know if you can tell right now, but there's about 10 birds in there and they just keep trying to add more and more um, into the nest box. So it's kind of an interesting thing to see. Um, Okay. So now what about when they're both hungry and sick? So this one again is kind of conflicting because when they're hungry, they're very active and when they're sick, they're very inactive. So what do you think they'll do in response to this compound stress? So someone thinks they'll sleep, um, sit by the food and rest. Um, I see a question that do some of the birds help the others and bring food? Um, 
So I haven't seen that yet. And so I don't think they do that. Um, but it's a really interesting concept. There are birds that will help each other out, but I just haven't seen that in the finches. Um, okay, so I'm not going to show you a video for this one because it's uh, hard to see and we have conflicting responses. So I'm gonna take you through a couple of graphs of the data that I collected on this. Um, so there's a group of us that go up and kind of record um, their behavior. So how much time they spend resting, how much time they spend flying um, and so on in response to these different treatments. Um, and so in this graph, we're looking at how much time they spend resting. So our control birds, that's just our normal happy birds without anything changed in the environment, all the resources available, they still rest a decent amount. The sick group rests even more as expected. Our hungry group looks to be a little bit active, more active, so they're spending less time at rest. Um, and then this hungry and sick group, um, they show this really wide range of response. So we have kind of anything from 65% resting to 95% resting. So this really wide um, change, and it's really hard to see, to say why. So when we look at this a little bit closer, trying to figure out what is going on here, um, we can separate it into male and female birds. And we see something really interesting. So don't get too overwhelmed by this graph. I just want you to focus on these two box areas. So our, we can see here our female birds are showing us the same response as the hungry birds. They're a lot more active, spending less time at rest. Um, oh, and the sick, the sick group is still in processing, but I do have that data. They should be resting up here if you're wondering about that. Um, but then our male birds, um, they're showing more of the sick response, so they're less active. So we have these two conflicting responses um, to the same stressor. And it's really interesting. Um, uh, so like I said in the beginning, I study the intersection of behavior and physiology. And so this makes me wonder if there are physiological differences and what's causing these changes in behavior. Hey, Devin, we have a quick question. Um, um, before and so move. one way I thought of answering that just really basically was looking at um, body condition or the weight of the birds. So the males are a lot bigger. And so we thought maybe the males have um, bigger energy stores. They can, even if they feel sick, um, and they're hungry, they can afford to sit around because maybe they, they have more energy stores, whereas the females have less energy stored and they have to go out and look for food. And so maybe that's the difference. Um, but when we look at their change in mass, we see that both the females and the males tend to lose weight in comparison to the control, but it's not significant when we kind of analyze this closer. It does seem like the females are losing a little bit more weight than the males, um, so a negative number here means they're losing about half a gram, whereas the males are losing about um, a quarter of a gram. Um, so there, there isn't a significant difference, but maybe there is this change in mass. So it just kind of opens these different avenues for studying, okay, what are the physiological responses that are causing these differences in behavior? And how do these stressors affect the physiology? Um, so why does this matter in the end? Um, so I think there's a lot of different reasons why we might want to understand why different environmental changes and stressors can affect behavior and physiology. Um, so this is basic science, it's considered basic science, so animals and humans um, should have a relatively similar stress response. So um, we can kind of learn as far as the human relevance. Um, how birds respond might be similar to the same physiological responses that humans might have. Um, and then from a conservation standpoint, um, there's a lot of things happening. There might be reasons why food isn't available as birds are used to having it available. And so we can kind of understand um, how they would respond to changes in their food source, for example. Um, and then overall, this affects, so if um, certain things are stressing out these birds, causing them to change their behavior that could eventually also affect their survival. Um, and that eventually then could affect 
evolution and we can learn about how these different stress um, reactions and responses evolve over time. Um, okay, and so that's just kind of a little snapshot I have of how we can look at stress and physiology and behavior in zebra finches. Um, and so with that, I just want to say thank you for having me and thank you to my lab group. Um, I work with George Bentley and these are some of the postdocs, grad students, and then we have a group of undergrads that work with us to collect some of this data and study birds. Um, I'm happy to answer questions now, and if you don't get to any questions, um, you're welcome to contact me um, and ask me further. Thank you, Devin, for a really great talk. And it was really cool to see um, videos of your uh, scene for finches as well. Um, we do have an audience question. So they asked, would you say, what would you say is the most common stressor amongst zebra finches? Um, they asked like if temperature, for example, seemed to be a consistent or most common stressor. Sorry, I realized that I had the sound muted and I missed the first half of your question. Um, <laughs> can you repeat that? <laughs> no worries. Yeah, so someone asked if um, there's a, the most common stressor amongst zebra finches. I'm guessing the stressor that affects like, you know, the majority of the population or like almost all. Would it be something like the temperature change? Um, I, yeah, I guess like something that affects the whole colony would be, I think they all would be affected by temperature change um, as well as food um, restriction. Um, yeah, I mm -hmm. think they all kind of affect them equally. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then we have another question. Um, does this probably apply to other types of birds? Like, can you also observe other bird species and their reactions and changes in physiology to indicate other environmental factors? Yeah, definitely. There's a um, ton of studies looking at how different stressors in the environment affect their behavior and physiology. So I know there's, um, I think, like Jenny Liang at um, in some place, a university in Nevada, I think, uh, looking at how sound pollution um, and light pollution can affect how they respond um, and their breeding. And so there's a ton of variables that can affect um, behavior and physiology in various birds. Okay, that's cool. Um, and then another question, do opportunistic breeders in the wild have less stress than seasonal breeders since living conditions for them are favorable year round? Um, I actually think that living conditions for them are not favorable year round, which is why they are opportunistic breeders, um, because they need to be able to respond. So like maybe they're in the desert and they're going consistently for a long time without food or water. Um, and once they come across food and water, they have to respond right away and be ready to breed. Um, whereas seasonal breeders, they can use daylight as a cue and know, okay, at this time of year, it's going to be spring um, and there will be resources available. Um, but I think it's hard to say who's experiencing more or less stress. Okay, thanks. And then I'm um, just checking the chat really quick. Um, so I think there's a question I might have missed earlier, but um, one of them was asking about, do sick birds just lose appetite generally? And then also, um, if do you think that there could have been another variable besides gender to break down the data? Um, yeah, so um, yeah, so sick birds, they tend to decrease their appetite. Um, they also do tend to sleep a lot more. Um, I think they tend to be less social. So zebra finches are a really social species of bird. Um, and so they're less social. Um, and then, um, let's see the other one. Oh, why did I break it down by sex? Um, let's see, I think, so a lot of my research focuses on reproductive behavior. And so I'm always interested in different sex differences. And so that was kind of where I just first went to. 
Um, but I will look into all the other variables that are there as well. Um, I think it was a good variable in this case because there did happen to be a difference um, between males and females. Um, but we're going to look at other physiological factors like circulating levels of glucocorticoids, for example, which are a common stress hormone in the body. Um, and that there's a lot of um, different variables we can look at. Cool. Thank you so much, um, yeah, for taking the time to answer our questions and for sharing about your exciting research. And before we start to wrap up, I had just kind of like a big question, picture question for both you and Silu, where I feel like that um, there's kind of a possible cool intersection between the study of physiology and response to stressor in the environments and seeing how that might lead to speciation. And I guess in light of, you know, especially with climate change happening and a lot of environments changing for bird populations, um, I guess do you all have know about like current research focusing on like that sort of intersection or or more generally are there is there research going on that you're really interested in related to that um the impact i guess of yeah climate change on bird environments um, um devin do, do you want to say first <sighs> you can start yeah you're welcome to go Okay. Um, yeah, because I'm really <laughs> excited about Jenna's question. I um, that's related to another avenue of my research that I didn't have time to go through, is the climate change influence on the species boundaries, um, because one of the speciation genes um, that I mentioned to you a little bit uh, about the mitochondria was um, about the climate adaptation. So so that's um, uh, my mitonuclear mitochondria and nuclear genome co-functioning collaborating uh, for the birds to adapt to their breeding environment and and then you can imagine if these are important barrier effect genes uh, to prevent gene flow then as climate change changes and these tr um, markers are connected to climate the species boundaries would also change um okay yeah that makes sense yeah thank you so much for expanding on that Sue. yeah um so a lot of my work focuses on food uh, availability and quality and so a kind of interesting new field that i'm looking into has to deal with epigenetics and how um, food availability or quality early in life can affect behavior later in life um, and how that can be passed on epigenetically and then affect future generations um, and how they behave and respond to different food stress in the future. Um, so that's just one avenue that I'm excited about, but I think there's a lot of different ways to look at it and there's a lot of cool research happening right now. Wow, yeah, thank you again, both Devin and Silu for sharing your insights like on your current research and also um, beyond. Um, so we're so glad that yeah, you're able to come and take the time with us and um, in tandem with Berkeley Public Library having an avian theme month. Um, and I'll have Kelsey take us away. Thank you so much. Those were two really great presentations and it was just so neat to hear about your work and meet the birds this time too. Like uh, just, it was neat to see so many different birds in this presentation, it was really cool. Um, just as a reminder for those audience members who are into birds, um, we are doing our Bird Week, Bird Zerkley, Berkeley Public Library, doing events about birds. Uh, this week, the next one happens this Thursday on May 19th at 6.30 p.m. to 7.30. You can go to our library's website to find the YouTube link um, to log in. And um, the two leading Cal Falcon orthonologists, Lynn Schofield and Sean Peterson, are going to talk about this season at the Campanile, Annie, Grinnell, and Alden, and all that their falcon family has been through. Um, this Saturday is a Cal Falcons program for kids. Um, that's happening at 3.30 p.m. And once again, you can go to our website to find the link. 
And then next Tuesday on May 24th, 11 a.m. to 12 p.m., um, two uh, bird scientists, um, bird behavioral scientists um, from tubing in Germany will be talking about um, avian uh, intelligence and they work in a crow lab. So they're gonna, they're, they're gonna specifically reference crows in that event, but also talk about birds in general. Um, so thank you so much. Thank you, Silu and Devin. Thank you, Science Bubble team. Uh, this has just been a great evening and um, I hope everyone has a good evening. Wishing you all the best and thank you audience members who tuned in tonight. All right, bye.